Department of Medicine and Internal Medicine, and I'm the moderator for uh, most of these sessions. And uh, this is your Own Your Health, Health uh, St. Paul's Community Forum. And it's uh, something we've been doing now since um, 2009, the third Wednesday of each month. We're trying to give public talks on uh, diseases and health conditions that affect uh, a lot of people, and also for you to see what we do at St. Paul's, the expertise in research, teaching, and clinical care. And so over the years, we've been able to highlight uh, a number of our faculty here. And uh, they've been, I think, generally very good and well-received talks. And also, if you've missed some of them in the past, they're on our website. There's a video podcast of them, so you could listen to them again. Or if you have family members who may be interested or, have, or if you have friends who have a similar disease, they could also get more health education from these talks. All the PowerPoints are also put up, and we have a fact sheet on each one. And there's a fact sheet out there if you missed getting it when you came in. You can pick it up when you leave. So I'll just do some housekeeping. Um, Dr. Ramji and Dr. Ko, I'll introduce shortly. Um, they're going to speak uh, for a little while, and then afterwards, what we'll do is have you write down your questions, and Muni, our assistant here, will come around and pick them up. And if you could just write one question at a time and do your best handwriting as possible, otherwise I just make up your question, and I want to ask the question you want. So just one question at a time, as clear as you can, and I'll ask it on your behalf, and then the experts here will answer them the best they can, and uh, we look forward to hearing them. So I'll start now. Um, first of all, we have Dr. Alnur Ramji, and he's a clinical assistant professor here at UBC in the Division of Gastroenterology, and he works primarily at the St. Paul's Hospital site. He completed both his internal medicine and his gastroenterology training here at UBC, and then he went to the University of Toronto and obtained a fellowship in hepatology. And uh, we're very happy that he came back, and he's pursuing his, both his clinical and research interests in uh, hepatology. Uh, Dr. Hin Hin Ko uh, has recently joined uh, our, the division here at St. Paul's Hospital and at UBC. Um, she's a clinical assistant professor, and she did both her internal medicine and gastroenterology training here at uh, UBC. And she also followed in Dr. Ramji's footsteps and completed another year of training in hepatology and nutrition at the University of Toronto. So um, I guess Dr. Ramji was her mentor, and she followed in his footsteps, and now they're working together. So we've, we're developing a great clinical expertise and depth in this area, so I feel very happy to be able to invite them to come to the podium and present today. So please, a nice warm round of applause for them. Thank you, Anita, for the kind uh, words, and thank you all for coming tonight. It, it's wonderful to see so many people out here, and it shows you, I think, I hope, how important liver disease is, and also uh, perhaps we can clear up a few areas of liver disease. Um, so as Dr. Palapu was saying, uh, Dr. Ko and myself work through St. Paul's Hospital. We're both gastroenterologists, and we spend half our time doing gastroenterology, so bowel and stomach, liver, and, and that sort of disease. And the other half of our life is spent in liver disease. And the majority of our time with liver disease has been hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Um, and our clinical research um, areas of interest are also hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And um, everybody who does liver disease has to do some fatty liver disease because of how common it is as well, so we do that as well. So today we're going to talk about uh, liver disease overall. Objectives tonight, I, I want you to get a bit of an appreciation of what is really hepatitis, understand the evolution of liver disease. We're going to look at an overview of hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and fatty liver disease. So firstly, the liver is actually the body's largest organ. And you look, it weighs about three to four pounds. The size is 15 to 20 centimeters. So you could essentially think of it as a football size. And it's located essentially um, under the rib cage on the right-hand side. So that's where the liver sits. And most of the time, you don't actually feel your own liver. You may feel like you get to, to the edge there, but you're probably feeling the liver edge uh, sorry, you're probably feeling the rib edge as opposed to the liver edge itself. I, I put this diagram up because we always try and be complex with the liver, and I, I want you to get the feeling that it's not as complex as you'd otherwise think. It's, it's made up of eight segments, and we use this anatomically, particularly for surgery, for example, but really the liver is just one body organ. Now, I think it's important to take away from tonight that hepatitis simply means inflammation of the liver. Hepatitis is Latin for inflammation of the liver. It does not mean a person has hepatitis B or hepatitis C, because there is a misunderstanding with that. When I tell a patient, you have hepatitis, they immediately say, oh, dear God, 
what do I have exactly? It sounds like a terrible thing. And it only means it's inflammation of the liver or elevated liver enzymes even. So there are many different causes of hepatitis. Not all of it is just related to hepatitis B or hepatitis C. If we look at studies on hepatitis, what are the common causes of abnormal liver enzymes or hepatitis? Well, alcohol is a very common cause, and we see that in 11 to 48% of people. Fatty liver disease is going to be the most common cause of hepatitis. Hepatitis C is somewhat common, and then miscellaneous, you know, hepatitis B, the type of immune types of liver disease, um, storage diseases of too much iron and too much copper. The diagnosis of liver disease is usually established using just simple blood work. So we don't often have to go on to what we call a liver biopsy. Majority of times we get the answer from doing lab tests to see if persons have hepatitis B or hepatitis C or immune or other types of liver disease related to too much iron and too much copper. In those persons who we cannot get a diagnosis on the blood work, most often it's probably related to fatty liver disease because unfortunately as yet there's not just one test for fatty liver disease. So we usually um, exclude everything else and then we can comfortably say or to some degree say that this is probably fatty liver disease. If you look at the causes of hepatitis, there are a myriad of causes. You can see how many they are up there. Viral causes are commonly thought of, so hepatitis B and hepatitis C cause chronic liver disease. And other causes are like hepatitis A, which we don't see very often in all honesty, because people often have it and then it disappears without us actually knowing about it. Or even hepatitis D or hepatitis E is quite uncommon. Alcohol, as you know, does cause a type of liver disease, as does fatty liver disease. Um, you have certain drugs and toxins, so even Tylenol can cause some inflammation, but doesn't really usually lead to long-term consequences. Hemochromatosis is a fancy word of saying too much iron in the liver. There are autoimmune causes, and that's like immune types of liver damage. There is types of alpha-1 antitrypsin, which is another kind of storage disease. People can have too much copper, and then rarely people have what we call primary biliary cirrhosis or primary sclerosis and cholangitis, which is, again, immune types of liver disease. But these are honestly quite uncommon. It's important to take away today also the fact that natural history of liver disease is usually a slow one. So I have on this diagram what we call stage of fibrosis. Stage of fibrosis really means how much damage there is in the liver. And the way I explain this to patients is people can get inflammation of the liver where your liver numbers are high, which is called hepatitis. And then with time, this inflammation leads to scar tissue. That's permanent damage on your liver potentially. And the way I attribute it or correlate it is, you know, if you fell down on the road and you really brush yourself and really hurt your arms, is red and swollen. And if that happened to you every single day, that scar continues to build up and the scar becomes denser and denser. That's what we see as scar tissue or fibrosis. And as you see on the top diagram here, you start off with minimal fibrosis, and then when you get what we call stage four fibrosis, that's when we say you could have cirrhosis, okay? So it takes quite a while for this to occur. It may take 20 to 40 years in some patients. A lot of people think that once they have liver disease, they should suddenly be symptomatic. You know, they come in and you say, you got liver disease, well, suddenly they become fatigued. That's not always going to be the case. Majority of patients actually can feel completely well. They just have elevated liver enzymes followed by the family physician, and then they're sent in for evaluation, and they still feel completely well. It's only really when you get cirrhosis that you may actually have some symptoms of liver disease. Okay. So I wanted to show you what exactly means healthy liver and a big scarred liver, and what happens with these processes. So with time, when you have a healthy liver, you can get some damage or this inflammation, and the liver gets swollen up because it's that swelling, the redness, the hotness in the liver, which we term as hepatitis. With time, that hepatitis inflammation, like I said, leads to scarring, and you go on to get cirrhosis. When you get cirrhosis, that's when you have an increased risk of liver cancer, usually not before that. So it's uncommon to go from a healthy liver to liver cancer, or even just hepatitis to liver cancer. Usually you should have cirrhosis. When we talk about severity of liver disease, this is just a simple cartoon and shows the liver cells and essentially what I'm trying to show here is with time you get more and more scar tissue 
and then as the scar tissue develops into more of these tracts, you can see it forming almost a honeycomb in there, and that's what we term cirrhosis when we take a biopsy and we look at it under the microscope. Now we're going to switch to hepatitis C. So Dr. Cole will talk about hepatitis B and fatty liver disease, and I'll spend the rest of my time talking about hepatitis C. And, and as you see with this Newsweek article, and this was back in 2000 more or less, it is seen as the leading cause of liver disease in North America, and it still has been to this day. And fatty liver disease is common, but when you think of hepatitis C, it's the one that causes increased risk of liver cancer and liver cirrhosis and liver transplant in North America. What has been concerning in the past, particularly, is that there are a lot of persons affected, and this shows over 3 million Americans affected, and they call it the stealth virus because it's very silent. And people can feel completely well, like I was saying before, and actually harbor the virus with it causing slow liver damage and not really know about it. So that's why certain people should be tested if they are at risk. Pamela Anderson was actually very useful for this endeavor because she had hepatitis C and she went publicly to say that. And after that happened, they said, well, if Pamela Anderson can have hepatitis C, other persons can have hepatitis C, let me get tested and let me think about treatment. So it, it really brought hepatitis C a little bit to light in 2002 with someone like Pamela Anderson coming up and saying I have hepatitis C. If you look at the prevalence, so how common is hepatitis C in the world, you can see in this small bar graph here the different color distributions. In North America, we say about 1% of the population has it. But in Vancouver, as you know, we have persons from different parts of the world. So if you look at some place like Egypt, over 10% of people have it. And as you see, other places in Africa have a higher rates of hepatitis C, as well as in certain places in Asia. So we really have to think about where people are from as well, because there could be higher rates of hepatitis C. Hepatitis C is also have six different genotypes. And the genotypes you can think of just as subtypes of the hepatitis C within this one big strata of hepatitis C. So it's like the many cars, and there's a Toyota, there's a Nissan, etc. But they're all cars in the end. It's the same concept. So we have six genotypes, it's called, and the more common genotypes you see in, in North America are types 1, 2, and 3, with type 1 being the most common at 70% of persons affected with it. This graph, bar graph shows in, in the United States, and this is supposed to be 2009, the distribution of the risks developed associated with acute hepatitis C. And in some persons, this is in the white bar here, about 30% we don't have any data. It's interesting, in about 20% of patients, we can't attribute a risk. So I see patients often in the office who have hepatitis C, and they're really worried. They'll be, they've, they've done something wrong, or they've got it in some way, and we're not sure about But really, in about 20%, I'll probably say up to 30%, we don't know how they had it. So it could have been simply when they were a child that they had a cut on their arm, and they were bleeding. They went to the school teacher, and there was somebody else with blood there, and they simply exchanged blood at that time. They got hepatitis C or with early childhood care. We didn't know about hepatitis C 40 years ago when people got infected in that manner. There are other persons who are at risk for hepatitis C, and those have been persons traditionally who have had blood transfusions, though we don't have as high a risk anymore. It's really quite minute at this stage. Um, but in the past, anybody who's used injection drugs, even if they've tried it once in their life, they're at risk. Um, there's some persons who use intranasal drugs, and they may also be at risk. And then sexual practices as well. Even living with another person who has hepatitis C may put you at small risk if you shared toothbrushes or shared razors. I had a patient, actually, who had lived in Canada all his life. He went to Cuba, and he got hepatitis C from going to the barber. He got hepatitis C because he got this face shape with those razors, and they didn't clean the razors off between patients. So that's how we got hepatitis C. So, you know, it's difficult to always track down how persons get hepatitis C. And as I tell patients, really, the past is not very important. It's what we can do today and think about the future with hepatitis C. As I was saying earlier, mo the majority of people don't have any symptoms with hepatitis C. Some people, though, do get malaise. They feel flu-like. Some people can feel quite fatigued and tired. Some people have anorexia, not very hungry, just don't feel well. It's rare that somebody presents with jaundice and hepatitis C. It really is rare. I can't think of the last time I saw that presentation. Arthritis is seen in patients with hepatitis C. And when your doctor examines you, you might have a large liver or large spleen. And truly, liver failure as a presentation for hepatitis C is rare.
okay, that we don't see. You know, patients have probably had liver disease for a long time and then can present with liver failure as other complications. So when you get hepatitis C, really the question is, what happens in the long term? So if 100 people got hepatitis C, 20%, and probably truthfully in these days, up to 30% will get rid of the hepatitis C on their own. Their immune system kicks out the hepatitis C. We don't understand how, but the immune system gets rid of the hepatitis C on their own. And 80%, they have a persistent infection, we call. Now, there can be a variety of persons. There are some people in whom the disease is quite stable and chronic and really non-progressive and doesn't cause much damage. And they would do well throughout their entire life. And I've seen ladies in their 80s and 90s with hepatitis C who've had the disease all their life, but are just fine, just perfect. There are some persons in the, where the disease progression is variable. It, it, goes far, it goes quickly and then it goes slowly, but they can have a moderate amount of liver disease. And there are 30% of patients where the liver disease is quite aggressive and progresses quickly. And that essentially works out to about 24 or 25% of those persons originally infected. So in about a quarter of the persons with liver disease, secondary to hepatitis C, we see cirrhosis. Okay. Now when we get cirrhosis, what does that actually mean? When patients have cirrhosis, that's when they are at increased risk of certain things. One is the fluid on their abdomen. You see pictures of patients with big liver, big abdomens with fluid on there, and that's called decompensation, where the liver is not able to comp compensate anymore. That's called ascites, or fluid in their abdomen. Sometimes they can have varicose veins in the swallowing tube and end up bleeding from that. And in some situations, they can have episodes of confusion as well, and that's all decompensation. So when we look at patients who have cirrhosis, and we follow them out at five years, about 20% of these patients can get decompensation. So what I'm trying to tell you, it's a reasonably slow process, and there's a lot of time for us to intervene and change things if we can. The goal of treatment in hepatitis B is to eradicate the virus. So the way I explain this to patients is, we can actually eradicate the virus. So the virus is gone after treatment, okay? Once the virus is gone, the abuse of the liver is no longer there. And the liver, I'll tell you today, is the smartest organ in your body because it regenerates, okay? It regenerates with time. So if you leave the liver alone, with time, the liver disease, the scar tissue, which I talked about, will slowly get better. It may take five years, it may take 10 years, but it slowly gets better once that abuse is gone, whether it be hepatitis B or C or what it may be. And obviously the secondary objectives are to decrease the risk of liver failure or liver cancer. Now I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about how effective treatment has been. So if you look at what we call sustained virological response, which is the same thing as saying viral eradication, or eradicating the virus, in 1986, the response rate was 6%. Through the late 90s, we went up to about 34%, and in 2001, about eh, just about 35 and then 40%. In 2002, we had a good revolution of medications, where we had what's called pegylated interferon, which is an injectable once a week, and ribavirin, which is pills every day, which is a type of antiviral medication. And the overall response rate was 55%. Now, if you remember, I talked about genotypes before. If you had a genotype 1 or 4, so certain subtypes of hepatitis C, the response rate was 45%. If you're lucky enough to have a different genotype, two or three, the eradication rate was 80%. So that's a substantial difference. So since 2002, we've been quoting basically these numbers until about three to four months ago. So three to four months ago, a new type of drug has been released and approved by Health Canada called the protease inhibitors. Now it's important to remember this is only for the genotype one patient. So the patients, I'm sorry, the patients who were usually who were here with saying 45% eradication rate, that's what we're talking about. The twos and threes still have the 78% eradication rate. So when you look at this genotype one patients on the interferon therapy and the ribavirin, I was talking about a 40, maybe 45% eradication rate. But look at that. With this newer addition to the medication, so you have a third drug on there, the response rate goes up to almost 70%. There are two drugs uh, which have now been uh, approved. One is called bosepavir. And the other one is called tilapavir, and I'm sure you've seen this in the newspaper as well. And with that drug, we get about 69 or 75 percent eradication rate. So quite similar, but that's the ability to get rid of the virus in these patients. But remember, it's a three-drug combination. Now, this is not true for all genotype 1 patients. Those patients have previously been treated. They may be more difficult to treat, 
patients with cirrhosis, we know are a bit more challenging to treat, but certainly there's significant promise there for now. Then you hear about interferon, and the next thing you think about is, oh my God, it's a chemotherapy drug. So what I tell my patients, please do not go and Google these things. If you have a question, ask me and ask my nurse. Because people who have good effects don't often sit on the internet complaining about things. You don't listen to the you know, six o'clock news and hear only good things in the world. It's usually the not so good things. It's similar to interferon. We hear a lot of negative things out there and people get scared and they don't actually want to try the medication. So it's worthwhile to take an objective assessment. So people do feel fatigue. People do feel flu-like in about 60, 70% of patients. People can have irritability and depression in about 30%. And people's blood counts can go down, maybe a slight increased risk of infection as well. But when I look at my patients who are actually on treatment, 80% can continue working. And that's a very good marker. How many of the persons who are working today who go into treatment, which is reasonably tough, this is tough treatment, can continue working? 80%. So it tells you, yes, it's tough treatment, but people can do it, and they're able to work at the same time. I think it's important to appreciate at the end of this is that for genotype 1 patients, the protease inhibitors are here. And I'm sure there would be some questions about this. So I thought I'd address this with a slide. Uh, it's called bacepovir and telapovir. It's in combination with the interferon, so the injection once a week, as well as pills every day. It's what we call response-guided therapy. So if you clear your virus early, we're able to decrease the duration of the treatment. Health Canada has approved it all. Both have a drug identification number, so they're available essentially in the pharmacy. The cost is expensive. So for the Bacepovir, it's about $1,000 a week, which at the end of treatment can cost anywhere from $24,000 to almost $50,000. And you add on the cost of the interferon and rivavarin, and that's another $25,000. To Lapovir, we think will be approximately the same cost. Both these drugs have been pushed towards Pharmacare. We don't have an assessment yet from Pharmacare as to who, will, who it will be approved for, so we are awaiting that judgment as yet, because it is expensive medication. There will be some judic adjudication process as by which persons, probably those who are most unwell, will end up getting this drug sooner. Okay. As a last point on there, if anybody feels that um, they wish to have a say. I mean, we're very lucky in, in Canada, and particularly in BC, because Pharmacare listens to patients. They don't listen to drug companies, obviously, because there is a bias there. They listen to physicians somewhat, but they will listen to you as patients or as caregivers. So you can go on to the Medical Services Plan website, and there is a link onto Pharmacare, and you can actually get onto the link to say that you want to receive information about new drugs, and all drugs will have a period of about three weeks where the public can actually write in and give the comments and say, please approve it or please don't approve it for certain persons. So there is that option to be able to do that. And I think it's important that you can exercise your rights in this fashion to be able to really help persons get these medications if you want. Okay, thank you. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Cole and then we'll answer questions at the end. Okay, so I'm going to change the gear a little bit. We talk about hepatitis C. So I'm going to talk about the next virus. In some ways, very similar to hepatitis C, but in other ways, very different. And treatment is also quite different, too. So I put a very fancy picture. Uh, it's a DNA virus. It's a kind of like a cousin of HIV as well, too. And unlike hepatitis C, you can get it. It's like you can get classified infection that's acute or chronic. And Usually, if someone gets it acutely in, as a kid, a baby, or young children, they usually get asymptomatic, the majority of them. But when you get as an adult, I mean, 50% of the chance you might get symptoms like flu-like illness. Some people might get yellow, like yellow eyes, jaundice. But the older you get exposed to the virus, you have a greater chance of clearing the virus. So for example, I'll give the numbers here. If you're an adult or older, like basically you're older than five years old, more than 95% chance you will fully recover and then you become immune to this hepatitis. But when you get as a baby, or when you get, get it when you're less than six years old, so the chance to clear the virus is very low. It's like only 5% will clear the infections. Now I'll just graph it, more easy to understand what I just mentioned. So on the y-axis, 
the vertical here. So I mentioned the risk you become a carrier. And then here is when the age when you got exposed to the virus. So if you get it when you're exposed to when you're a baby, so almost like as I mentioned before, 95% of chance you become a chronic carrier of hepatitis B. But when you're older, older five older than five years old, the chance you become a chronic carrier is very, very low. So I just put here, so like, how can you get hepatitis B? So this is a fancy pine graph showing all the different risk factors associated with acute hepatitis B infection. This is the data I got from the state in 2006. So mature them is very hard. I think based on the history, you have to talk to patients, where they're from, what kind of risk factors. But with, in adults, the majority of them is like homosexual, bisexual male. And then they find sexually, as you can see, more than one sex partner or homosexual so sexual contact is one risk factor you can get hepatitis B, including the heterosexual. So all these risk factors are from sexual contact. So the other percentage you have IV drug user and some surgeries, and then you have sexual contact. You know someone have hepatitis B and you have sexual contact. So they, you can see from the graph here, the contact is from body fluids, sexual contact, sharing needles, blood transfusions. Now globally, about 2 billion people have hepatitis B. So a lot of people have hepatitis B in the world. And then 350 million people are chronic carriers. And they estimate close to 500,000 to 1.2 million deaths related to hepatitis B causing the complication cirrhosis. So I'll give you a graph similar to hepatitis C, like where you can find hepatitis B, the most common areas. So it's easier to put the numbers on the table here. So in the Chinese area, basically the Asian, so in Taiwan, Vietnam, China. So you can see this means someone have hepatitis B as a carrier. So over 10% of people in Taiwan, Vietnam have hepatitis B. Compared to the states, it's 0.2 to 0.5%, so very low prevalence. So as you can see, the darker area, very blue, are all like Asia, like Africa as well. But in North America, where Canada is, the majority is like very low, less than 2%. But I put here, in Vancouver, it's higher because we have a lot of immigrants from different places, like from Asia, people from uh, Vietnam, Taiwan. So the percentage is higher. So we estimate probably like, we don't, we don't have a good number, but definitely much higher than 0.2 to 0.5%. The incidence rate of acute hepatitis B, I think about 700 cases per year in Canada. So as I mentioned before, what are the possible routes to get transmission of hepatitis B? So you can get it from a car vertically. Basically, you can get it from when you're born, from your mom. Or you can get it horizontally. Basically, is you contact someone with contaminated like needles, uh, blood transfusions, or have sexual contact. Someone is known to have hepatitis B. You have sexual unprotected sex. So body fluids exchange, you can get it like this way as well too. So usually you find if you get a vertical transmission, it's from mother to child. And because you expose us to so when you're very young, so the chance to become chronic carrier is much higher. And then they estimate about 10 to 20% may develop cirrhosis. For, from adults, mostly you just get it from sharing like body fluid contact exposure. Acute disease, you might have symptoms, but very, very low risk to become a chronic carrier. So what are, how do you know you've been exposed to hepatitis B? So we say there's an incubation period, just like you know you're exposed to someone had a flu, someone sneezed on you, for example. You might not get sick right away, it takes a few days. So hepatitis B similarly takes maybe six weeks up to six months before you had show some symptoms. But typically, you may if you get exposed as an adult, you will have like fever, you're tired, headache, just like a flu, you have muscle ache. But after there's acute infections, the number of people get become chronic carrier. Again, I'm going back to the same slide. It really depends on how old you were exposed to hepatitis B. So when you got as a baby, some high chance you become a carrier. But for adults, they may go through this flu-like illness, but afterwards they test again. They basically develop immunity. You're not a chronic carrier. We just know that you've been exposed, but the infection is resolved. You're not a carrier. You now have the immunity to hepatitis B, even though it's not through vaccination. But because you've been exposed to it, you become immune to that infection. But people become chronic carrier, just like hepatitis C. You have this virus now living inside the cell of the liver. They can cause inflammations, just like irritation to the skin. You form more scars. So as more inflammation going on, 
So more scar form in the liver. Eventually, the soft and spongy liver can look like very scarred, hard, and nodular. And because of that, you might develop like have a higher risk of develop liver cancer. So our list here is a long list, but I just want to highlight a few risk factors that allow us sometimes to predict maybe certain group of patients with chronic hepatitis B, they may more likely to develop cirrhosis or complications. We usually find men have a higher chance than female, the older the, per the person is. If they have sustained <coughs> chronic liver inflammation, if they do blood work, chronically the liver enzymes like, like have inflame, inflammation going on. So I mentioned that more scar will be, more likely scar will develop. Or you have other conditions affecting the liver. Let's say, very unfortunately, you also got hepatitis C. So now you have two viruses living in the liver. So you have more insult to the liver, more likely you will develop complications. So if you have fat or if someone drinks a lot, so more hit to the liver, more likely you will develop some damage to the liver. And smoking as well too, because cigarettes are known to cause accelerate the damage to the liver. So complication I kind of alluded to. So people can have hepatitis B really rarely, but sometime when adult got it, maybe they can develop fulminant hepatitis. They become the liver suddenly have so inflamed, they lost their function. So we just say so full blown uh, inflammation of the liver. Sometimes the liver can do, cannot handle this insult. They may be not able to function properly. Cirrhosis just means the scar tissue in the liver and hepatocellular carcinoma, just a fancy term to describe cancer in the liver. And people can die from complication if they have cancer in the liver or they have very scar liver now that they cannot function properly. Because liver, as Dr. Ramji mentioned, has a lot of, we think it's the most important organ, but we are a bit biased we, because it produces a lot of like, proteins, uh, clear the toxins, metabolize the drugs. So if you lost those functions, of course, you may can suffer from complications. So you eventually might die from the complication of liver disease. Now, unlike hepatitis C, hepatitis B, you can actually prevent it. Because we have, a, a, besides personal hygiene, which I'll mention later, we have vac vac vaccines to prevent you from getting hepatitis B. So number one thing is personal hygiene. As I mentioned before, remember that really complicated pie graph? All the risk factors involve exposure to body fluid, blood. So remember, don't share any needles, toothbrushes, razors, or any blood contaminated products. So during sexual intercourse, if you're not sure your partner has hepatitis B or been checked before, just make sure you protect, wear condoms. Now, strategies, so besides a good personal hygiene, you can, go, you can have vaccine to prevent hepatitis B. So we emphasize vaccination of the babies, adolescents, or groups that with adults we think they are high risk. For example, if they have multiple sexual partners, uh, they use needles, um, if they have inmates. If you have a, someone in the family have hepatitis B, I recommend all the household um, to get vaccination against hepatitis B. Or healthcare workers, because we expose to body fluid sometimes. So if you're at a high risk, we also recommend you get that vaccination. So you said, is vaccination very effective? So this is a, they published a study in one of the good paper, a clinical paper in New England Journal of Medicine back in 1997. It's a study published in Taiwan because they have a lot of hepatitis B patients there. So basically they find, as you look through the graph, in 1981, when not that many people got the vaccine, we're looking forward in 1994. So as more people get the vaccination, they find the incidence of hepatitis B, as you can see, is dropped from 0.7 down to 0.36. Definitely is a clear drop in, the, in terms of the incidence of hepatitis B. And they find the mortality related to hepatitis B, related to complications. Also, you can see the same trend as you, the year more people got vaccinated, less people die from hepatitis B related liver complications. So basically mean vaccination is very effective. So as I mentioned before, so vaccinations, we have become the hepatitis B vaccine, and they find more than 95% of the um, children and adults, after three doses, they are completely protected. Sometimes we use immunoglobulins, because you know vaccine takes a while, just like your flu shots. I mean, you need your body, your immune system, see this foreign protein to start making like, asking your immune system to produce a soldier, so you recognize it. 
But sometimes it takes a while. Let's say you've been exposed to it. You accidentally had a needle stick injury. We might have to give you immunoglobulin. Basically, this is the antibodies already pre like have exposure. If they recognize hepatitis B, they can start working. So sometimes we may need both a vaccine and give some antibodies, like if someone just have a very high risk exposure. So I talk about vaccination for infants. So you basically, I recommend to test all pregnant women for hepatitis B. So if, a, if the mother doesn't have hepatitis B, but you know at high risk, let's say the father or someone in the household have hepatitis B, I would recommend vaccine the baby as soon as they are born. So remember three doses. One dose is not sufficient. It's not effective. We need three doses in order to have achieved this 95% chance we can ensure you have adequate immunity. So vaccine the baby is month zero, one month later, and then six months. So you know, because mom doesn't have hepatitis B, so not high risk, so we don't need to give that protein, the pre may one. Let's say if the mom have hepatitis B, so remember what I said earlier, that if the mom has hepatitis B, so very high chance the mom can pass it on to the baby. So I would say, again, make sure the baby, as soon as they were born, give them the vaccine at zero month, one month later and six months later. They comment that if the baby is premature, because we worry that maybe when they premature, the immune system may not be working that well. So some of the group recommend giving them an extra shot, like in another vaccine at eight months. Then you say, oh, do I really need to check about whether I have like, enough immunity to hepatitis B? So we usually recommend maybe to check the hepatitis B. So if you talk to your family doctor, they will know the right test to check to make sure you respond to that vaccine. Now, what about the adolescent? I'm not talking about the babies, but adolescent or the groups that are likely to expose to hepatitis B. So in the BC, we have this universal hepatitis B vaccination program since 1992. Basically, all the students, when they're grade six, I think if they go through <coughs> since 1992, they, all the adolescents should be got, be got vaccinated through the school vaccination program. Let's say you miss it. Um, you go away from school or you did the grade six after, like before 1992, you can still talk to your family doctor or if you belong to the certain high risk group, for example, like um, children from the immigrant families, if you know someone in the household have hepatitis B or you have high risk factor, you can talk to your family doctor and still get the vaccinations. Other people in BC, we recommend if someone known to have other hepatitis, for example, hepatitis C, HIV, because like I said, you have one, you don't want to get an, uh, any other insult to the liver. So hepatitis B is one hepatitis we can prevent. So I would strongly recommend to get the vaccinations if someone has other hepatitis, like C, HIV. If someone is hemophiliac, because you know they need a lot of blood transfusions, but now, Blood Cross is really good. They screen all the blood for hepatitis C and B. So the chance you get hepatitis from blood transfusion is extremely low. But you know, they're still constantly exposed to blood products and all the needles. So I still think it's a good idea to get the vaccinations. Similarly, for dialysis patients, they come to the hospital three times a week. A lot of needles go through different uh, procedures. So I say anyone just have high risk exposed to blood products, um, needles, should get a vaccine. And then students, um, and then with a bone marrow transplant, if someone have immune system suppressed, not a bad idea to get one vaccination to protect you lifelong. So what about the adverse re reactions, the side effects from the vaccinations? Basically, in like common thing, just like a flu shot, you can have pain right aside you get the vaccinations. You may feel tired, headache, fever is less than 1% and really, really rare you get any other side effects from these vaccinations. But you have to do it three times. It's a series of three vaccinations. So what about treatment? I would say not as um, exciting as hepatitis C, with Dr. Ramji mentioned that new drug coming out. But I will tell you, hepatitis B, unfortunately, I cannot tell you it's a curable disease. I, would, I usually use the analogy, kind of like HIV, that we can control it really well but it's a very smart virus. It's a DNA virus that incorporates itself into your own DNA. So technically, we cannot say we cure it. We can control it really well with medication if needed. But not everyone with hepatitis B need treatment. Because hepatitis B sometimes can be 
remain really quiet if your immune system, it's almost like a constant battle between your immune system and the hepatitis B virus. If your immune system, like being able to take care of it, suppress the virus into a very like inactive stage, we just watch it. We don't need to treat everyone. And even treatment, is, the goal is mainly to control it, to minimize the hepatitis B getting too active, leading to inflammation in the liver. So if we decide that someone do need treatment, let's say someone get signs of inflammation in the liver secondary to hepatitis B, then we would, the goal, number one, is to try to control the virus, make it less active, almost we call them inactive. If we do the blood, maybe we try to, the goal is to keep the virus undetectable if possible. And then ultimately, which is not easy to do, sometimes they may lose that protein to say, oh yeah, now the patient appears that hepatitis B is completely inactive. Like I mentioned before, the goals of treatment to basically is suppress the virus from being too active. And we want to stabilize the disease. We don't want the liver to get more inflammation or more scar, eventually leading to prevent the liver from getting cirrhosis, the end stage. A lot of scar means cirrhosis or cancer. And uh, viral eradications, maybe in the future, we might be able to find something that we can get rid of it. But at this moment, we're just trying to control it. And current treatment options, well, one treatment is rather serious, similar to hepatitis C is the needle, but only selected groups of patients will benefit from the needle um, treatment. And then the majority of them, like all the like, really complicated medical like names of the drugs, is all oral drugs. Main goal is to suppress the hepatitis B from replicating, from producing more of itself in the, in the liver. So in summary, just understand hepatitis B is, is a chronic infection when you get it exposed when you're young. And some people, if untreated, leading to a lot of chronic inflammation, eventually leading to a lot of scar in the liver and make you have a slight, like higher risk to get cancer. Now, just be aware that vaccine is available. If you don't have hepatitis B, you get the vaccine, you are prevented to ever getting hepatitis B. There's something you can prevent it. Even if you have hepatitis B, we have treatments. We have very good oral drugs that allow us to completely suppress the hepatitis B, control it from, we prevent the virus from getting active. If really needed, let's say the treatment, now the liver so damaged, just like any other liver disease, just like hepatitis C. I mean, of course, the last option is we can wait for a liver transplant, just like people need a heart transplant or kidney transplant. So we can still do a liver transplant, but this will be the last option but it's an option, just like the other failure of the heart and kidney that I just mentioned. Now I'll say some questions for hepatitis B after. So I'm gonna talk about fatty liver. I would say in my practice, probably more people with fatty liver than hepatitis B. Partly, it's because of the, it's a consequence that we know more and more people are obese, not just in adults. So I include a picture with kids that is it's a problem in the younger generation as well too. So I'll give you some pictures, and the one on the right is like a biopsy, basically a needle, go in the liver, get a sample, look under the microscope. So this is how a normal liver looks like, and you have see like the pink one, like the cell, and the dark spots are like the, the nuclei in the liver cell. So you can see here, it looks a bit yellow, just like you see fats in the chick, under the chicken skin, so yellow, the fat in the liver. So you see a lot of like, almost like cheese, like little, little bubbles in the uh, biopsy. So if you have more fat, I mean, probably the color is more yellow, and you should see able to see the cell in the liver. It's hard to see in um, the screen over there. But the liver cell actually get bigger. Just imagine like um, you have fat cell grow inside the liver, so the fat can balloon up. And you also see a lot of flat globules sometimes inside the liver. But again, not just hepatitis B or C can lead to scar in the liver. Even fatty liver itself, when it causes inflammation, Basically, it's a fancy term to say fat leading to inflammation in the liver. They can also cause scar inflammation in the liver. Eventually, when the liver is so scarred, so people can get liver cirrhosis just due to fat in the liver, not due to an uh, infection. So basically, fatty liver, just like the term mentioned, it just means you have accumulation of fat inside and around the liver cells. I think in the North America, maybe the most common of all liver disorders. And it's more, we see more and more each day. Family doctors see them. 
we the specialists also see them more and more of like people with fatty liver. They estimate about up to 20% of the general population have fatty liver. And in someone who is obese, have type 2 diabetes, up to 75% of patients actually, if, if you do ultrasound, which I mentioned how to pick up fatty liver, they said up to 75% of these individuals will have fatty liver. Even in children, they find in 3% of children, if you find a, a obese children, more than 50% of them can have fats in the liver. So you heard about people talk about uh, fatty liver inflammation. It's a spectrum. So initially, if you just have fats in the liver, we call it a fatty liver. But you heard people talk about NASH. It's just, again, very, we, use, we like to use term to describe different things. So basically, I mean, it's not due to alcohol, because alcohol can lead to fat accumulating in the liver. So N mean non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. hepatitis, basically not related to alcohol, but fats in the liver causing inflammation and eventually scarring the liver. So it's a spectrum. Initially, just simple fat, and then more inflammation can lead to scar. So how do we diagnose it? I mean, sometimes you can pick it up from ultrasound, but basically, it's many times we, we need like liver biopsy to see like alcohol. Basically, it looks like exactly someone drink alcohol, but in someone you have to ask about the alcohol intake. They will say, no, doctor, I didn't drink any alcohol. So it looks the same, but when you talk from the history, it's someone they don't drink minimal, maybe one glass a week or a few glasses a week. Now we're looking back, you know, in the past we have people coming in with a scar liver. We do all the workup, workup for hepatitis B, C, everything all negative. We tell them cryptogenic basically means we don't know, someone has scar in the liver. But now thinking back, probably those patients may have fat in the liver to begin with for many years. Eventually when we see the end stage result, just scar in the liver. By that stage, we don't see fat anymore. So we're thinking that maybe many people, we used to label them as, oh, you have scar liver, but we don't know what it is, called cryptogenic cirrhosis. Actually, maybe they just have fatty liver for many years, and now we're just seeing the tail end of the picture. Now, how common is it? I kind of like mentioned briefly in my um, two slides beforehand. So in the Western country, 20 to 30 percent of the general population have some fat in the liver. If someone morbidly obese, up to 90% of them will have fat in the liver. And I mentioned children, like you can see in obese children, 23 to 50% of them can have fat in the liver. So this is just mean simple fat in the liver. Now NASH just means you have fat and some inflammation. So if you do some blood tests, your doctor will tell you that your liver enzymes are getting a bit high. So it's definitely some signs of damage, so some inflammation. So we find 2 to 3% of the general population have high liver numbers because it's from the fat in the liver. And if we, someone has risk factors, like they're a bit overweight, they have diabetes, up to 37% have fat and some degree of inflammation in the liver. So they find female more likely to have fatty liver or inflammation in the liver than male. And they list the European, Hispanic American more so than the African American. So what about the associated conditions or potential causes for fatty liver? Now I would say the number one is we call them the metabolic syndrome. Basically, if they're overweight, especially is more the central fat obesity. If they have type 2 diabetes, high cholesterol, or basically insulin resistant, I mean they're just that type 2 diabetes. So if all this risk factor make them more likely to have fat in the liver. We find cardiovascular disease like hypertension. But you know, hypertension also kind of linked to people who are a bit overweight, that type 2 diabetes, kind of all related. So some other causes, if someone had like, oh, like rapid weight loss, sometimes people are thinking like, oh, I'm losing weight, how come I have fat more deposit in the liver? I mean, I try to explain, sometimes when you lose, try to lose weight so rapidly, I tell them the liver is, I, we think it's the most important organ, but it's not very smart. When you're starving yourself, the liver thinks you're starving. They will say, we need to store some food now in the liver. So they try to kind of collect more fat in the liver. But then, you know, rapid weight loss is very hard to maintain. So eventually, you gain back all your weight. So you gain the weight back, you're now collecting more fat in the liver. So you're actually hitting the liver twice with this fat accumulation. So I always tell people, lose weight slowly, but the goal is to maintain your weight loss is the best way. No rapid weight loss. So they find some drugs. 
a list here that may lead to more likely to deposit fat in the liver. For example, common like steroids, another term like prednisone. So some drugs tend to more likely to deposit fat in the liver. So then what about how the natural history of fatty liver? In general, like I mentioned before, if you do a liver biopsy, it looks like someone who drinks a lot of alcohol. They, so they compare people who have fatty liver inflammation from alcohol intake or just from fat alone. They find that in general, people just have fat due to, let's say, a bit overweight, diabetes, or high cholesterol. They do better than people from drinking, causing the liver disease. So they find that, if, but in compared to general population, like they're matching same age, same gender, they find that people with fatty liver, they don't do as well. But I think, you know, they probably have other risk factors. Like they have, maybe they have hypertension, they have diabetes, they're overweight. So they not do as well maybe because of other risk factors as well. But if someone had really advanced liver inflammation from, from a lot of fat accumulating in the liver, and if they have scar, fibrosis, scar in the liver, so is this worse than someone just has simple fat in the liver. So they might develop cirrhosis and had a risk of um, liver cancer. So I just put this as a progression of disease, like a simple picture. So if someone overweight, basically this means liver fat, like fat accumulating in the liver. So overweight people, 30 to 90%, they have fat in the liver. Now up in people with just fat in the liver, we just call them fatty liver, about 20% may develop some inflammation, the, the NASH. So over 20 years, they find if several PC people with inflammation and fat in the liver, they may develop scar in the liver in 20 years. So it's talking about a long-term process. And then I put here is maybe a bit over, like a number maybe too high, they quote in one literature. It's that over seven years, if you have scar in the liver, I would say 10% not just liver cancer, I would say any liver-related complications. But when you have cirrhosis, you definitely is at risk of liver cancer, but probably not as high as like 10% over seven years. I think they mean just in general all the complications, not just mean cancer. So I put here mortality is liver related, it's up to 25% within the seven to 10 years once someone becomes cirrhotic. So in North America, they find that um, it accounts for up to 10% of the reason for liver transplant because it's the reason for this liver failing is because of fatty liver, not because of anything else, not because of hepatitis C or hepatitis B. So why do some people, they are overweight, let's say you have two people, like one is overweight, type 2 diabetes, but they have no fat in the liver, or they have fat, but they never develop inflammation or scar in the liver. But on the other hand, someone that's very similar, they also have type 2 diabetes, high cholesterol, but someone just very young and they already have some inflammation, some scar in the liver. So we think it's more than one thing playing a role uh, causing why someone's more susceptible to this damage from the fat. So we think it's involved a lot of pathway. As I mentioned before, if someone had insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, they think it could be like a, some injury, a different pathway happening, or too much fat accumulating in the liver. Or it's also, I think, it's genetics. Someone just has very good genes. They may have fatty liver, but they will never develop scar or inflammation in the liver. But someone, if the gene is more likely to predispose them to have any damage, even if they have one risk factor, they maybe just have a bit of central obesity, they can also. So it's very hard to predict. At this point, it's very hard to look at someone and say, oh, you are more likely to develop um, cirrhosis from fatty liver. So, so far, we don't have a really good way to predict. So if anyone comes in fatty liver or have a sign showing inflammation, I basically tell them, yeah, we really don't want, to, want your liver to remain healthy, no more damage, so we'll talk about the ways to manage a fatty liver or prevent it from getting worse. So how do we know? But usually, it's asymptomatic. You won't have any symptoms. Usually, as people go to have an annual checkup, family doctor check out the liver enzymes, oh, they notice their liver enzymes is high. They usually feel completely well. And they find liver enzymes, the AST, ALT is probably elevated in close to 90% of the people. The definitive way to find out is it truly fat in the liver is a liver biopsy. Um, but sometimes we don't need to. So I'll just show you a picture. It's, it's basically, you, we've done it under ultrasound. So it's just like going through an ultrasound test to look at your tummy, look at your kidneys. But they go to put a needle through your skin and then just a little go in the liver, get a little sample. 
So it's not like an open biopsy. So when I pe tell people it's a liver biopsy, they think it's a, day, a, a surgery, you have a major cut. It just goes through an ultrasound, but there's a needle going through your skin to get a little sample from the liver. So from diagnosis to, and then how do you stage a disease is we rely on the history. So if someone drink a lot of alcohol and they show up with have fat on the ultrasound, then we know it's not just fatty liver, it's related to alcohol leading to fat accumulation in liver. So we want to make sure we exclude other reasons. So we want to screen for hepatitis B, C, and all the causes Dr. Ramji mentioned, the whole list of things we want to exclude everything else before we label someone that ah, most likely you have fatty liver, causing your liver enzymes to be abnormal. Most of the time, ultrasound's pretty health, uh, helpful. They can basically sometimes see like, oh yeah, the fat, the liver look a bit um, fatty. They will basically comment like fatty infiltration in the liver. So ultrasound is a very good way to detect. But earlier on, if you have just a bit of fat in the liver, they might not be easily detectable by ultrasound. So ultrasound, when you see a lot of fat, so it's not subtle, it means you have quite a bit of fat in the liver. So the gold standard, we're not sure, we think you might have a bit of fat, is still a liver biopsy. As I showed you the picture, you see the, the, the liver cell got more bigger, and you see all the little holes, which means the fat globules near the liver cell. But nowadays, we try to find a way non-invasive, because we try to think of doing tests that we have minimal risk as possible. Sometimes we have, like, kind of like an ultrasound, we have a fibro scan machine. It just tells us whether, it's a good way not to tell me about fat, but let's say someone I know they have fat in the liver, but I don't know whether they have act like inflammation or scar in the liver. So what the fibro scan does is kind of like an ultrasound, again, putting the probe on the right hand side here. It just like, a, like tell me how much, how the stiffness of the liver. So if someone had a lot of scar in the liver, it would be very stiff. So it's kind of like a non-invasive way to look at the liver without having to go through a liver biopsy. So about, what about treatment for fatty liver? I'll tell them there's no proven effective treatment at this point. So I always say is to target the risk factor. So I encourage people to lose weight. But it's gradual, no rapid weight loss. I just say I said aim to lose about 10% over the next year. So I say even if you lose two pounds in a month, I'll be very happy rather than you lose it and you gain it all back. So weight loss is number one. And then if you have any other risk factor, like diabetes, high cholesterol, I'll tell them, even though let's say your doctor said your cholesterol is borderline, I'll say because you have fatty liver, maybe it's a good idea to discuss with your family doctor to get your cholesterol level under better control. Good for your liver and possibly good for your heart and like stroke prevention. So I would say, talk to your family doctor, target the risk factors. There's some study looking at maybe supplement with vitamin E, metformin is a drug, and pioglitazone. Those two drugs are used to treat type 2 diabetes. So they find those two drugs might be helpful to treat both diabetes and may some benefit in the treatment of fatty liver. So I would say number one thing is weight loss, like active, avoid all the junk food, and then just treat all the risk factors that will be the best treatment for fatty liver. No, I think that's it. Mm -hmm.